single moment that we will live it out according to your perfect will and according to uh, what we know to be your will. And God, I thank you for everybody that's here. I thank you for those that are going to join remotely. I ask your blessings upon each and every one of us in Christ's holy name. And uh, touch our uh, tech systems. Touch and anoint it, I pray, God. I ask that you would anoint those that are working it, and I pray that you would anoint uh, everybody that has a part today, and I pray for the anointing of the Holy Word that's going to come later. I pray for the anointing of uh, Reagan that's doing our, our child sitting. I thank you for her today. And anoint each one of us, God, to go out after we leave this day and to be workers in your harvest field. In Christ's holy name, amen. Okay, so... I hate this mic right into my face. It's like, you know, I can't see around it. So, anyway, we're going to start off today, of course, saying our prayer together. Is it up here? Yep. All righty. So, we're going to recite that together. Lord, I pray for justice in the world, for the lifting up of the poor out of their misery, for the breaking of the power of tyrannical regimes, for the end of violence, warfare, racial conflict, and strife. Thank you that you are a God of justice. Amen. And that is a huge, huge prayer, isn't it? Well, we're going to start our journey today uh, stopping off at Montenegro. This is in the Balkans. And so, as you know, we, uh, when we say the Balkans, we're talking about Croatia, Albania, Herzegovina, uh, Bosnia, and Serbia, if I didn't mention them. So all of these are kind of integrated, and there's a lot of strife even to this day among all of those people. So when we see some of these facts, we know, okay, this is what they've dealt with, and this is what is still left over residual in their culture. But anyway, we're looking at it and seeing 72% are orthodox. Well, you know, that's great in and of itself, but then there's a lot of infighting, especially the orthodox Christians against other Christians, and then you have the Muslims and, and uh, the Catholics and the orthodox that are, are always kind of pulling at each other. So when we see this, we think, oh, that's, that's fantastic, but uh, there's a lot of issues to work out. And then you see that they gained independence from Serbia in 2006. So see, this is a relatively new uh, country that has uh, come about, and when we see that, then oftentimes we're going to see lots of problems associated because they haven't gotten the kinks worked out, okay? So uh, you will notice that Freedom House says they're partly free, 67 out of 100. But anyway, there's some fun facts. There's some interesting facts. But there's also some things that is, is, not, uh, is not pleasant at all. And number 11, it seems contradictory. But what they're saying is it's a low crime rate in the country. You can go there and feel safe. But high levels is, of course, corruption and organized crime. And then you see the background of where they've come from, and you go, oh, that's the reason. Number 12 is seriously a problem. They do not take domestic violence issues seriously at all. And sometimes, more times than not, they side with the perpetrator instead of the victim. And then I was reading, too, the children are horribly abused in these situations. And then, of course, it's a major route for illicit drugs. And then you can keep on going down and see how that trafficking and ex uh, sexual exploitation is a, a problem in this area. So let's go to prayer right now over this country. God, God, I pray over this president and this prime minister. Lord, first of all, I pray that you would touch them in their spiritual well-being. I don't know what they uh, ascribe to God, but if they're not believers in Jesus, I pray that their hearts will be touched now. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to go to them and convict them in their spirit spiritual being, and that as they turn to you, Father God, then they can do better for their country. I pray that they'll be able to govern well. I pray, Lord, that this will be a just and peaceful and a corruption-free nation which enjoys ethnic harmony, God. I pray that people will seek the truth of Christ in the midst of their newfound nationhood. I pray for new spiritual life to come to the nation's orthodox community, that you would just do a transformation in this particular group, God, that, Lord, it will not be just a symbol or just a habit, but that they will actually come to Christ Jesus, Lord, with great devotion and fervor. I pray that evangelical congregations will continue to grow and that they will be a witness 
witness in the face of opposition and that they too will be unified and be fruitful in ministry. And we pray, God, always for those that are poor, those that are abused, and those that are affected by the drug business and against the corruption in government. We pray now, God, that you would look upon this nation and let your spirit go forth ministering to these different ones. In Christ's holy name, amen. Now then we're going to Morocco, which is in North Africa. And as you see, they're 99%, well, for all practical purposes, they're going to be 100% Muslim uh, with just a few uh, believers. Uh, and we look and see how that they are not, not receptive to the word at all, okay? So we have all of these different agencies that are saying there's high persecution there. Freedom House, they're only ranked 37 out of 100, which means that for all practical purposes, again, they're not free. And then you can go on and look at some of the things that there's really wonderful things about this place and would actually be one of those places that I would love to visit, but I would be a little bit hesitant. But also we see number 15, that there are 50% of women that suffer domestic violence and only 28% report. So that number is probably gr much higher than that 50%. 80% uh, 88 percent of the Moroccan children 6 to 15 are well educated but that that's kind of the top end at age 15 and of course we see that many children are vulnerable to abuse and exploitation and uh, some of the girls there the young girls have been horribly mistreated so we need to pray over those so father god we pray right now for the leaders as they govern their country for their spiritual well-being and that they will recognize christians as a non-threat we ask god as there's a reported just 2,000 Christians that are involved with 20 to 30 small house fellowships that, Lord, lots of times they, they face pressure from so many different areas. We pray for the growth amidst this persecution. And, God, we're going to think of them as the early church, that through their faith and their witness and their mutual support and encouragement, that, God, not only will they serve you, but, oh, God, that they'll bring others to your, to your kingdom. And we pray for all of those that are in the unreached minority peoples groups, the Berbers, the Maghreb, the Jews, the nomadic desert tribes, and the Moroccan Arabs. Lord, we pray now for them, that, God, there will be you, Jesus, showing yourself to them, either through a person, through angels, through visions, however, God, you want to do that. We pray for the unveiling of Jesus Christ. We pray for the women who suffer abuse. We pray for those trapped in profit, proper, poverty. We pray for the production of Christian television programs. And the Lord, we pray now for good reception on these Christian uh, television and radio programs and even on the internet, Father God. And uh, we ask that you would touch them now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And there was, I'm wondering, I think it was this one. Let me try to find if it is. Yes. Number 13, there's more cell phones than people. So that has a lot to do with internet as access. So we just pray, you know what? Let them stumble yeah. on the holy word of some sort. The Bible app, the chosen, just anything that comes through. Lord, we pray for an anointing that that other other programs will be blacked out. And even if there's uh, these programs coming in that are Christian oriented, that God, if it has to just come to individuals phones not even on a a, a wild a wide uh, uh spread app or just you know honed in to individuals we pray that now thank you lord now then our next one's mozambique and if you know uh, about heidi baker you will know that she is very much entrenched in mozambique and we look at it as 46 percent christian and there's a breakdown there and we think of it being a country that's friendly to Christians, but there is many, many, many persecutions that are going on right now. And a lot of it is Islamic insurgency, especially in the North. And I found out by reading some of the things that Stewie had sent me from her ministry that they are, that they, the ministry is embedded in that area as well. So Cabo de Gato is one of the worst places. And so she is ministering up there. So when I had heard recently in the news about how bad it had gotten, I was thinking that maybe she was in the middle to southern areas and that she wasn't in the thick of this, but she is in the thick of it after I read this. And I want to just show you, I got this little um, newsletter from the Voice of the Martyrs, and this particular one was just focusing on Mozambique. And it talked about this minister that 
well, a lot of ministers that had to flee, a lot of Christians had to flee. And he still lost his four-year-old and his seven-year-old, cannot find them. So in the midst of all of the chaos, I don't know what, where he was in respect to where they were, but to this day he still cannot find them. And, of course, many, many, many were slaughtered. But this is one of his quotes. He said, Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And he is crying as he's saying, his name's Armando. But my sheep are scattered and I don't know how to find them. The pastor still doesn't know what has happened to his children. And so here's this man that Jesus has told him to stay right where he's at. And he said, how do I find my sheep? And so, uh, you know, as we pray for them today, look at that. Look at how they're just praying and uh, worshiping the Lord. And here's the burned out places that that they had come back to. So, you know, our hearts just break over this area. And it's right down here. So this is an area that is not typically what we would think would uh, be prey to the Islamic terrorism, but it is spreading. So anyway, as we come on down, you're going to notice that they are one of the most poor and underdeveloped countries, 70 percent uh, poverty. Six out of 10 women suffer domestic violence. They suffer violence and famine and diseases. And, of course, the children's rights are hugely at risk. So Stewie had put down here on number 15 as you go about your week and want to maybe look this uh, Heidi Baker up. Her agency is called irisglobal.org. You can look, uh, click, uh, click on that and find so many wonderful stats of, of what they are doing. So, Father God, we pray right now for the president and his spiritual well-being and that he, too, will govern well. We pray that Christians will rise up with faith and love, expressing it throughout the society. We pray for opportunities for fruitful ministry. We pray for growth and maturity and truth as numeric growth occurs. We pray for the unreached peoples groups, God. God, that are so numerous in this country. We pray for missionaries as they endure many hardships, as they try to travel, and Lord, as they, they are uh, prey to diseases or, or bad weather or poor infrastructure. And then they have very real spiritual demonic powers that they have to fight against. So God, we pray for their strength now, for anointing God that, that only you can give them. We pray for leadership training, initiating youth and children's work and medical programs. And God, I also I want to pray over Heidi Baker and the ministry group, the Iris Global Ministry Group, which is just one of probably many that are there. We pray a special blessing upon them. Father, we pray that they will see such um, fruit coming about. And just like I saw that they were providing houses for different people, building homes and, and making up little villages for the different ones. We pray a hedge of protection about those that are living in these villages that, oh God, you would uh, surround them with angels and that, oh God, they will be successful, Lord, not only in the, their practical lives, but more so in the spirit realm. Father, we pray it now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now then, we're coming to Myanmar, or what used to be called Burma, if you have been a student of geography. And of course, this is 88% Buddhist. And a lot of times we uh, think of Buddhist as being very calm and very peaceful. Well, you know, obviously there's a, a, another side because they will not even allow a lot of uh, tourists cannot even interact with the locals. So they've been told, the locals have been told, do not interact with the foreigners. And, of course, they have a lot of uh, persecution, not only towards Christians, but as we will go on down, we'll see persecution towards the minority of the Muslims. And here we see Freedom House says not free, now, nine out of 100. I don't even know how they get nine. I, I mean, just, you know, zero. If you're not free, you're not free. And then, of course, you can see the history of how, number four, that they have been uh, suffering under long civil wars and, and military corruption. And the military are the ones that have been so um, persecuting towards the Muslim women. Let's look down here. I want you to notice this. Number seven, genocide of the Rohingya people. And they are described as among the world's least wanted and one of the world's most persecuted. Breaks my heart. It kind of looks somewhat like Kuwait with uh, the Bhutan people, and this looks similar to that, but I think it's even um, more so uh, persecution. And, of course, we see number five, that child soldiers were conscri uh, conscripted into the military. They were forced to labor, human trafficking, child labor, 
And there's many wonderful things as we go through here and look, but there's so many things that are not great. But let's look at number 13. Thousands of Buddhist monks have quietly become believers, and many study the gospel and listen to Christian radio. Thank you, God, for that. See, that's how God weaves in. And there's no spiritual dark forces that can stop God from reaching people's hearts. Isn't that a wonderful fact right there? So, Father God, we come to you. We pray for the president and the prime minister to govern well and for their spiritual well-being. We pray for this quiet movement of Buddhists that are coming to Christ Jesus to keep spreading the gospel, growing in you, deepening in their faith. We pray for Christians and missionaries to unite and be encouraged and keep their witness even as they themselves are embroiled in protest against this evil regime. We pray for the many unreached peoples to hear the gospel. We pray for Christian literature to be distributed and for radio programs to be heard. We pray, God, oh Lord, I just, my heart breaks, even though the Muslims are not of our faith. Lord, it is not right that any group has to suffer persecution. We pray over the Rohingya people and especially the women and the girls that are so horribly abused and trafficked out of this particular segment of society. We pray, Lord, that Jesus Christ will appear to these women and these girls and to these people and that, Lord, that 4% Muslim will be zero Muslim because they've all come over and they're under the category of the Christians. Lord, we pray it now. We pray for drug addicts the AIDS victims, and the children at risk. Lord, we pray for your eyes to look upon this place now in the mighty name of Jesus. And lastly, we're coming to New York, which is the 11th state that was formed and is one of the original 13 colonies. There again, we see 60% Christian. You see the breakdown. And there are notable, there are many, many churches in New York, okay? And when we think of New York, everybody wants to uh, distill it down to New York City, which is the most famous, of course. But... Uh, I just wanted to do a shout out to the Times Square Church and Brooklyn Tabernacle Church, which are many, many, many of the churches there in New York City and New York. But they are very famous Pentecostal churches. Great, great testimony. You know what? They started out like we did. Did they not? In fact, the pastor's wife at Brooklyn, she put cutouts of people because they had a storefront. There was no one there except family. She cut out cardboard cutouts of people and stuck them in the chairs in faith. I told Danielle, we got to do that. We have got to start putting fake people in our seats until they become real people. Is that right? Times Square Church, just a miracle story. If you want to find something that's uplifting, go to uh, Times Square Church or even just type in David Wilkerson slash Times Square Church and it will give the story of how he started that church, which is an absolute miracle and has was growthed out of uh, like drug addiction houses that he had started and gangs and all of that. So see, God is able to raise what beauty out of ashes, isn't he? And so right now we are just right now seeing everybody sitting in these chairs and then having to stand up until we have to go to another place, right? Okay, that's off track, but it's a shout out for our church and for these churches that started just like we do. Number three, really interesting, 8 million people live in, in New York City. So that means one out of our 38 people in the U.S. live in New York City. I don't even know if I believe that fact. But I, I'm assuming it's true. Now then, 800 languages are spoken. The most diverse city in the whole world linguistically. And then, of course, you know, I, I hate to say this, number four, because I just believe Texas and Wyoming are the cattle ranching <laughs> states. But they had the first cattle ranch, so I, I'm, I'm going to succeed to them. But yeah. And then you can go out and see other things that are really interesting that if it was, if New York was a nation, it would rank fourth in the world economically. So uh, there are a lot of things that ties the rest of the United States into New York City and especially in the financial world. But we also see number 12, 32% women, 35% men experience domestic violence. The statewide drug abuse is higher than average. And of course, we can't even keep up with the crime rate, and especially in New York City. So these are areas that we really need to pray into. And you know, sometimes we just think, well, that's them. They don't govern well, so that's their fault. And you know, so be it. But we have Christians living there. See, we have believers that live there. And so, yeah, we want them to do well, right? 
Okay, so now we're going to pray for this governor, that God, you will touch this woman, that she will govern her state well. And Lord, any ideas that are not uh, good for the state, especially in, in, the, in the, the rates of criminality, we pray, God, that you would help her to see good sense. We pray for her spiritual well-being, God. We pray that she will be a Christ follower. We pray for revival to come to New York among the believers. We pray that a great harvest, harvest of souls will be evangelized into the kingdom. We pray for the success of their crops and their industry. We pray, God, for those affected by drugs and poverty, domestic violence, and against the unrained crime, especially in New York City. God, we pray, Lord, Lord, that you will have mercy upon this place and that, God, your believers will stand up and be counted, Lord, and that they will not give up in their well-doing. And we bless these in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord for that. It is. I was just over there. Um, imagining and thinking about the effectiveness of prayer it's a real privilege that our prayers are heard sometimes you're thinking you know if i could just you know if i could just get, have the ear of of the person who the decision maker the, the person in authority if they could just hear my story you know if you're a journalist you're wanting to get the story out you know if they could just hear my story you know maybe there could be change you know i just want you to know that um in revelation it talks about it in psalms it talks about our prayers rise as incense and this author i was reading about you know, it gives you a, a visual. It's like collecting your prayers, like in a, in a, in a, like a bowl, like an incense, but collecting them, you know, they're all coming up and he's collecting our prayers. You know, not one prayer is not heard. I mean, what, a, what an awesome thing. I mean, it's just the more I stop and when I think about it logically, I'm always just floored about how great of a deal Christianity is. It's an awesome deal. Okay. I'm not trying, you know, it's not a business thing. It's not a contract, contractual obligation. It's a covenantal, you know, situation. And that is a, just a whole new world. And that's a special uh, thing. Um, I just want to praise the Lord for that and thank him for hearing our prayers. God, I thank, I thank you that we get to have your ear. We have not, we literally, the only thing we've done is disqualify ourselves. If it's up to us, Lord, the things we've done, the things we've not done, have utterly and completely disqualified us from being near a perfect and holy God. However, that's a big however, you came, you left a perfect heaven and came to the place that this earth that we had gotten sideways. You came as a man, as Jesus Christ, as the God man. It's mind blowing, but it's what you've done. Um, and you, and you live the life we're supposed to live and you died the death that we deserve to die in our place. You substitute, you took it for us, took a bullet for us, took the cross literally for us and you make this all possible. So none of this would be possible literally without you, Lord. And so we thank you for activating your believers to create a, a community where we can really come together to live this faith out in the world that, um, in my opinion, I think constantly, uh, turns away, turns a nose up at it or, or shuns it and shoves it away and tries to eliminate it from their society. We say we welcome you, God. And with that, um, we just welcome you, Holy Spirit, into our time of, uh, of worship. We thank you for um, that you're going to be glorified in this time. The two songs we have today, um, one is called Shout Your Name. It's a, a powerful song about really kind of the identity that God has in for us the intentions you know we might be at a place down the road you know and have got, suffered some some dings and bruises and flat tires and so on and so forth but our identity is in the lord and it's he wants to redeem our original identity our original purpose our original calling and what's awesome is that he's god so no matter how many things he'll build uh, dings and bruises and all that it'll buff out he will work it out all right so praise god for that and the song after that it's called House of Miracles. So after we've had this surge of identity and getting focused and centered and stabilized and who God's made me to be, okay, then we're going to have a surge of faith, I believe. And so it's going to be uh, on the uh, TV here and all that and on the stream, by the way. Thanks for waiting patiently, working, waiting through all that. And hopefully uh, someone on there was saying that it sounds and we're good and good to go. So praise the Lord for that, too. Um, there's uh, 
there's somewhere like five to seven people online. So that's special. That's as many as we have, you know, give or take in the room. Anyways, so if Lauren is going to queue it up, um, I'm going to kind of do my thing up here. You guys just feel, take the, take liberty. Um, there's not, you don't have to sit, don't have to stand. You don't have to stay in your same spot. You can move around, connect with the Lord as the invitation. So we praise you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Worthy are you, Lord. Precious blood has paid for us all. You, you took. This is real good here. You came <laughs> back to life. Yes, so we will breathe our last, but we will never die. Let's hear that again. You conquered death. The victorious one. Yes, Lord. You came back.
right more than you. That's really beautiful. I love that. Thank you, Lord. Have it your way. Do what you, you long to do. Because, God, I still believe anything can happen when you move. So would you come and move here? Come on, sing it again. No one wants to make things right. No one wants to make things right more than you. Have it your way, do what you, you long to do, I still believe. Oh, thank you, God. That's your desire to make things right. Thank you that you just didn't want it, but you made it happen. You made, you sent Jesus. And we just repent. If there's anything we've done to offend you, we turn from it and run to you, God. And we believe for a f surge of faith. As we go through this next song, we're going to just be singing uh, from deep in our bones, we believe Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We proclaim this Evergreen Church is a house of miracles. Thank you, Jesus. It's not based on numbers or abilities, but it's based on your presence. And when you come, things change. We believe for that. We pray for churches around all over this city, this over the world, the over the ATW places. We believe and ask for you to move in power, Lord God. This is a place of praise. Yes, Lord. Where every demon trembles. Feel the power. Thank you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Where we proclaim your name. No other name, no other name but Jesus. This is a house of healing. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Are full of faith. You have our full attention. You have the final say. Amen. We believe that you. So come alive in the name of Jesus.
really cool you know we didn't you know look to do this song with this prayer point or anything for example but um, it's actually I'll give a shout out to uh, Madeline one of the things she submitted over on her prayer uh, the prayer points it's a cool fact there's in Montenegro I think Linda probably saw this there's something they call a phoenix plant which yeah it's a rising from ashes thing right it's it's a uh, it's called the Ramanda Serbica it's a legally protected flowering plant that can come, man, I feel the Lord on that. Thank you, Lord. Um, that can come back to life after being completely dry for years. Rain can come, and all of a sudden this thing literally, I mean, it, it baffles the biologists. They, they're like the botanists and all the other ists that are going, I don't know, it just, it just doesn't make sense. Well, listen, you know, there's miracles. That's, that is a factor at times. I mean, the fact that the things that we understand to an extent, work is a miracle, by the way. I mean, right? Just because we can kind of understand how it works doesn't mean the miracle's not there anymore. Because l- l- any one of us in this room, go ahead and just, you know, speak with your words and create um, a plant. Create anything with your words, you know? I know we can... Anyway, but it's a miracle. And so I just, I really feel that. Lord, and I I, I pray, and, and, and the song was, was right on there, um, Come Alive in the Name of Jesus. He said, everything in the name of Jesus. There's not another name we use. We don't use in the name of Evergreen, in the name of Stewie or Danielle or any one of you find people in the room or online. It's, it's the name of Jesus. It's the only name that's ever worked. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of names out there. And, I, you know, usually it's like one of those, you know, try it. Go ahead. I, you know, go ahead and see if it works. I'm like, I, you might do that. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I just go use, use the one that works to begin with. So, Lord, we thank you for that. And I believe that. I, I pray, Lord, for people that are now hearing this, that are, that are needing that rain to come and to revive. You literally breathe life into us. And, Lord, we're, I'm praying and believing that you will breathe life into us today. Now, I believe, I, I'm praying for people online that are hearing this, and even when we watch it later. I pray for a surge of life to come out. You, Jesus, talked about how you will be the wellspring. You'll have, a, you know, you won't be thirsty. You know, drinking, you know, horizontal water, if you will. You need to drink some vertical water, and you'll never thirst again. So we just ask that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our spiritual eyes and ears to hear what you want to say as Danielle comes to preach the word. I just pray you would anoint her powerfully, Lord, to to do what she's doing today, to bring the word. Uh, we thank you in the name of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated if you like. Okay, and while we're in that spirit of prayer, I want us to pray specific resurrection life and healing into certain people this morning. Uh, Father, right now we speak the resurrection, life, and healing of Jesus into Kelly Mosley's back. Father, let your mighty, mighty healing run all over his back. God, touch him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, Lord. Minister your love. Minister your healing. Minister your peace to him, Lord. We thank you so much uh, for him, for Jennifer, for them, um, Jennifer being in our church and the girls. We just pray such a blessing over their family. God, we pray right now for resurrection power to flow into D. Stewart's knee. Lord, that that knee will heal perfectly, Lord, because you're the one who has touched her. And right now, God, we speak to every place in our own lives that have been dead, every place in our loved one's lives that have been dead. And we say, come alive in the name of Jesus. That's what that song said. And really, that song is just echoing what Jesus said at Lazarus's tomb when he said, come alive forth Lazarus he called him out of the grave and Jesus we thank you that you're still calling us out of the grave today and we thank you Lord for your resurrection power we thank you that this is a house of miracles because of your name because of your power because the works that you did did not cease they did not cease when the apostles died they continued into the early church and for anyone who'd received your powerful spirit and we thank you for that today in Jesus holy name amen Amen. 
one reason we know they didn't cease is we heard a testimony um, just like maybe two or three weeks ago in our church denomination, the Church of God, um, there is a nurse, I don't even remember what, a nurse and a doctor, I don't remember which country they're on the mission field with, but um, a man had come in sick, he died before they got there, because it was a lower, lower income country, and he was like completely, completely dead, he had, had been called, and people just started praying, and he got up, like he got up off the table and took a breath, and they were like, well, Jesus just resurrected the dead. So um, that just happened. Like, that happened in 2022. That didn't happen in um, first century. Well, it did happen in first century Palestine with Jesus, but it happened now. So I just want to say God is still doing some amazing things. And it's just as amazing when we receive salvation. When we receive salvation, that's like somebody getting up off of a table of death or getting out of a tomb. When we receive a healing, when we receive a relationship that gets stronger, all those things are the resurrection power of Jesus. So today I want to talk to us about, I hope I'm looking in the right place on the stream. Um, but anyways, last week uh, we were heavy on consecration to the Lord. We took our message um, from King Solomon's life and we really looked at how our life how we don't want our life to go the way that his did, did at the end because we focused on really the fall of King Solomon and how all of that happened. Um, but after that kind of a sermon last week, we may, some of us may be saying, well, how can I practically like apply consecration, you know? And so I, I really want us to understand that and be able to apply it. Um, but the aspects that we were dealing with last week spiritually were, you know, how to have this dedicated life to the Lord from the beginning to the middle to our end. And we um, talked about that whole journey of faith with the Lord. And we know um, this is just kind of a review. The way to keep our hearts right with the Lord is to keep our hearts humble with him, before him, and to be constantly looking into the perfect law of liberty. And you may say, well, what's the perfect law of liberty? That is the word of God. That's another name for the word of God, and to be reading it and obeying it, to be communing with God through prayer. These are, like, again, some of the things we talked about last week. Um, but I also want to say having fellowship with the people of God, um, taking communion um, whenever that's offered, um, being, but being daily devoted to the Lord, that's how we remain consecrated to God, right? Those are the ways we can keep our hearts humble before the Lord and stay with him. But what I want to talk about today is that even as we, you know, as people, we may kind of have all these ways to stay consecrated, like that I just listed, but even so, um, we may not share all of the same convictions on every issue as Christians, okay? And that can be a little confusing when you look around, you're like, well, this Christian's doing that, but that Christian's not doing that. Um, but there is a passage of the word that's gonna, that helps us flesh out how the church should behave um, towards each other, Christian to Christian. Okay. And that's what we're going to talk about. That's how we're going to get really practical today. Um, but we're going to be in Romans 14. The message, I would call this message harmony. Um, how do we keep harmony in the church? And, um, but I want to give you some background to, before we get into Romans 14. So Paul, um, in this context, he was sending, uh, the church at Rome, some information on how to navigate some issues they had had. And um, they were really potential sources of conflict that he saw going on in the church. And at this particular location, you had um, Gentile, so non-Jew, uh, new believers in Jesus that had come out of pagan idol worship. And what they used to do that was they would sacrifice animals and sacrifice meat to those fake gods. Um, and so they had come out of that into belief in Jesus. And so they were very aware of how things were sacrificed and what had happened. Then you also at that same location had Jewish believers in Jesus who had been used to having Sabbath on a particular day. They had been accustomed to the holy um, festivals, which, which are still holy, you know, from the Old Testament that they had been celebrating. So you had this kind of gigantic... Um, convergence of cultures and therefore you have some conflict that can happen but 
we're all one in Jesus. And so Paul, that's what he's dealing with. He's like, I've got to get everybody on the same page here. So that's the context I want to give you. Um, we're going to turn to Romans 14, and that's where we're going to break down practically how we can live out our Christian walk next to each other. Um, I am going to be making making some comments as we read, so just be aware of that. So I'll stop every now and then and say something. But this is what I want to say first. Um, depending on which version of the Bible you're reading, this passage will have a different title. So, for example, I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation today. That title is The Danger of Criticism. But, on the other hand, out of the New King James Version, the title of that passage is The Law of Liberty. Those titles are equally powerful in how you can interact with this passage. So I just want you to hear that. Danger of Criticism and then The Law of Liberty. Okay. So let's start in verse one. We're just going to read that whole chapter. And this is what it says. It says, accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything. So now you know why I gave you the context <laughs> of eating. But another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. So I wanna stop there for a second. So you're looking at people who are like, I can't eat that meat because I don't know if it was sacrificed to idols before it was sold and market or prepared, okay? And then you have other people saying, I don't care that if it were sacrificed to idols because I know those, those idols are dead and they don't mean anything. So that's why you have sort of that clash going on. And But Paul is saying, hey, if you can do it and you don't care, don't look down on those people who can't eat it. And if you can't and if you cannot eat it, don't look down on the people who can and think that they're less of a Christian. So he's really like equalizing everything. So let's go on to the next verse. It says, this is a really key verse. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Okay, I want you to think about this. If my neighbor has like a, a, like a personal, you know, house cleaner or personal chef in their house or something, which we don't, none of us have, you know, we don't have like personal chefs, but let's just say we did. It wouldn't be my responsibility to judge how their person was doing their house. If that, my neighbor's glad with how they're doing their work it's none of my business, right? Well, so God, through the Apostle Paul and his word, he's saying, hey, there's one master and there's a lot of servants. <laughs> so he's like, so even if you serve the same master, y'all both serve me, you're still not the master of that believer next to you that's a servant. So don't criticize them. You know, they will be able to stand or fall depending on the grace that God gives them. And God, he's saying, God will be able to help them to stand. Okay, let's keep going. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord both of the living and of the dead. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. That part is really key. We will all stand personally before the judgment seat of God. So it doesn't matter what anybody else did around you or didn't do around you. You're going to be with him alone at one point in the very key point in history. And you're going to, to stand there and let him judge. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God, so let's stop condemning each other. 
Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Here's the other really important part of this passage. I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to, wrong to eat. But if someone believes it is wrong, then for that person it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. So if I know, if you know that a fellow brother or sister in Christ feels a strong personal conviction not to do something, it would be unwise and it would be sinful, not just unwise, it would be sinful to do that thing in front of them. Because what you're doing is you're possibly putting a stumbling block that can affect their life in Christ. And that would be bad for you to do that to another person. <laughs> That'd be bad for us to do that to another person. Um, and then the next verse says, don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. And another version of the word of God says, do not let your, ev your good be evil spoken of. It says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. So that's an easy way to think of that. So if you don't have a problem with X, Y, or Z, whatever that thing is, but if you know it's a controversial issue, if you know it could hurt another believer, just do it on your own. Just, you know, if it's not sinful, it's not sinful. But if it's going to bother someone else, just do it on your own before the Lord. Don't wave it around in their face arrogantly like, I can do this because I'm a much stronger Christian than you. That's not love. That's not the law of love in action. Okay, and let's finish this out. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. But if you have doubts, this is the third part I really say, this is key. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something or do something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. I'm going to read this again, verse 23 in New King James Version. It says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. That is a very powerful sentence. It doesn't matter if the whole world of Christianity thinks something's right. If I don't, I should not do it because I'm not doing it from faith. I'm doing it from doubt and fear. Therefore, it's sin. And so you can see how Paul is trying to bring this Roman church or this church at Rome together and say, look, regardless of what day you serve God, regardless of what you say, you, what day you say is the Sabbath, regardless of if you can or can't eat meat that's been offered to idols, does not matter. What matters is that you put the law of love above everything and honor each other as you honor God. That's the law of liberty in action. And so right now you may be saying, yeah, but like, you know, eating meat and all that, that's definitely from their time period. Yeah, but I'm now going to get into our time period in the modern day. So I'm going to talk about what the what liberty allows for and what a li liberty does not allow for. Okay, because when Christ came, he really blew open every um, man-made religious tradition that would not help people follow God. He took that off. He did not, though, break any of God's moral law. He kept it perfectly. When you see Pharisees getting mad at him for not, like, doing a little hand-washing ritual before eating, that was not something, some moral law of God that he was breaking. He just had the freedom to start eating. And they were like, oh my goodness, he did not wash his hands in the right way. And, he, and Jesus is saying, look, you're worried about the outside of the cup looking good, but man, the inside of your cup is so dirty. That's what I'm here to take care of. 
I'm here to take care of. I don't care what you look like on the outside. I care what you are on the inside. That's what Jesus came to do. And that's why he rocked everything at its foundation. But what does liberty allow for? Well, it gives us latitude, you know, meaning like a broad expanse of freedom. It gives us latitude within the constraints of holiness. So you're like, okay, that sounds theological again. doesn't sound very practical. I'll tell you what it is. It's the leading of the Holy Spirit. So that's what latitude within the constraints of holiness is. It's when you listen to the Holy Spirit, when you let him tell you what to do. Um, the, one of the verses says, don't be drunk with wine, rather be filled with the spirit. So he's, he's giving you these options, like let the spirit of God fill you to overflowing. I want to give you a really practical example, listening, the kind of music you listen to. Okay. Um, some believers listen to secular music. It doesn't bother them at all. It doesn't take them down a negative track. Um, but some believers do not feel comfortable doing that. And either way, it's okay. Now, I'm not talking about music that's like full of terribly ungodly language themes. That's not obviously what I'm talking about. But, you know, I'm not going to have a hard time if I just listen to some good oldies or something. You know what I mean? Personally. But you know what? Some people, once they come into Christ, they don't want anything to do with their old life. And maybe some of the music they used to party to or jam out to isn't bad music, but if they listen to it, it will pull them back into that world. And they will want to start uh, dabbling in that world. So guess what? If I know a friend of mine that's a believer doesn't listen to secular music anymore, then I don't play it around them, okay? The moment I find that out, I just don't play it around them because I want to honor them. Let's say that you're like you know, the, per the person that doesn't listen to secular music and you know your friend does, well, don't judge them that they do, right? It's just a really simple law of love and action. Um, so it's all about your own personal conviction. You know, that's that part of what am I allowed to do? Um, and what we're really talking about is fostering a heightened sensitivity to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You're fostering that heightened sensitivity where you're like, okay, Lord, is this pleasing to you? Am I about to do this in faith? Because I've asked myself that before. Am I about to do this in faith? Or are there doubts? Because if there's doubts, then I don't need to do it. I have got my answer. Um, but the other thing is you're also fostering a heightened sensitivity to believers around you. You're trying to figure out, if I hear somebody talking about something that bothers them, they don't have to directly tell me. I can just be like, oh, I picked up on that. That's a problem for them. I'm not going to like tempt them with that or do that around them. You know, you're just being extra careful around people. Um, but this is another thing. My freedom and my liberty to do something according to my own personal convictions, it stops where my brother or sister stumbling block begins. Yeah. That's it. You know, and, and if you're like, well, I really want to do that. Well, then do that at home. Do it by yourself. I already said that earlier, but that's one way to do that. So we honor believers around us. We don't give cause for someone to misunderstand our behavior. Okay. That's another thing. Don't let, that's another way of saying, don't let your good be evil spoken of. Don't let somebody like misunderstand what you're doing. Um, and then I like how verse 17 said, we should strive instead for righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's really what the kingdom of God is. And so I just want to tell y'all when I was younger, um, the Lord spoke to me one day and he asked me, he said, why is it that, and that was, I was younger in the faith too. I've, I've grown since then, but this was a part of my growth. He said, why is it that with things that you shouldn't do, things that are potential sin, you get to the very edge as far as you can, just without falling over the edge. And then why is it with the things that you should be doing, the righteous things, you leave a runway where you maybe get three quarters, but then you don't finish? He said, why is that? I need you to switch those around. <laughs> I mean, when the Lord says, I need you to switch those around, talk about personal revelation, I was like, whoa. The Holy Spirit just told me, I need to do the righteous good things of the Lord all the way. And those things that are sin or could become sin needs to have a long runway, 
before I even get to the edge, okay? So that's just an example of something the Lord spoke to me. I know he's spoken to all of us in different things, but there's nothing like when the Holy Spirit comes to your heart and talks to you. Okay, um, here's another verse I'm just going to tell you, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, uh, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I may have said those out of order. Um, against such, there is no law. So that's another way you can know what you, the law of liberty allows us to do. If, you do any, if, you're, if you're operating in any of those fruits, there's no law against you. There's nothing that you'll be doing wrong. It's a really awesome way to think about it. Now I'm going to talk about what liberty does not allow for. These are issues that are clear cut and they're not up for discussion for any Christian. And no Christian has liberty in this. And it's the Ten Commandments. They're a good example. That's a good starting place. Okay. Um, but Jesus brings even more clarity to the Ten Commandments. He dials it in even more. So, for example, Ten Commandments talks about no adultery, no murder. With Jesus, though, like I said earlier, it's not just what seems outward. He goes to the very inside of our hearts, and he deals with that. And this is what he says, okay? So I'm going to talk about what he says first with no um, adultery. What Jesus says is no lust. He says in Matthew 5, 27 through 28, you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, this is Jesus, I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay. So lest any of us think that we're doing great, Jesus brings it all the way to the very insides of us. And he says, I don't care if you didn't go sleep with somebody outside of marriage. If you even looked at somebody with a lustful gaze, you already did it. So go ahead and ask for forgiveness. Now, I don't know that he talked like that. That's me just putting some, some, spin, some spice on it. But my point is, that's how he hits me. When I read that, that's how I hear it. I hear it like, hey, like you think you may be doing good, but let me tell you actually what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the word of God that will separate the joints and the marrow. It will separate the soul and the spirit and expose everything before God. Not before your neighbor, before the Holy One of Israel. The one we should really only care, care about who thinks what, they, what he thinks about us. Um, but no, so that's, he takes it way deeper. And then um, on hatred, Matthew, hatred and murder. So for murder, for Jesus, murder is hatred. Um, Matthew 5, 21 through 22a says, You have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you're even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. So anger is okay if it's not sinful. But he's saying if you're getting angry to the point that hatred's boiling, you're murdering. And then even... Um, you know, that, that takes it way deeper. So that, you know what it does is it causes us to no longer need an outward teacher like Deuteronomy talks about, like Paul talks about. What happens is the Holy Spirit comes and he in our hearts is teaching us. You don't need your neighbor to tell you if it's right or wrong. You have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit to tell you it's wrong. And so therefore, suddenly you have people that they don't have to be told not to murder, not to commit adultery, all this. They won't even hate they won't even lust because they love Jesus so much, okay? That's what happens when you get a new heart, a new spirit, like Ezekiel uh, prophesied. So, and here's another thing. I, I, I made a comment on this last week. It's in my notes for this week. There are things that are not up for discussion. Pornography is not a gray area. It is black or white. Um, and I talked about it, and I mentioned that Stewie and me have a heart to minister in this area to people with no judgment and total love and to see people get free. So it's kind of one of those secret sins that people are like, I'm doing it behind the scenes. Nobody knows. God knows. It's not a gray area. It is adultery. It is fornication. If you're not married, it's fornication. Um, okay. I want to read a couple, another couple of verses on like hate and murder that come out of first John. 3, 14 through 15, it says, if we, if we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. 
And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. And so really here, the Apostle John is trying to remind us, like, again, love is the king of everything. It shows us if we're acting like Christ. It shows us if the life of Christ is within us. If I will put my brother or sister over myself and how I act towards them and what I choose to do around them, then I'm showing them I love them more than myself. I love God more than myself. So that's the micro version, person to person, how we act with believers. I want to zoom out for a second. I'm going to give you the macro version. And I'm like, and I don't really, this is not something I see any of us in Evergreen having an issue with or even anything in this message. This is just what God put in my heart to preach this morning. But I'm going to comment on denominations. So denominations within Christianity are not a problem if you love your brother and sister. You don't care. I don't care what, if you're non-denominational or if whatever is on your sign. The denominations are only a problem for people who don't have true, deep love for their brother and sister in Christ. Have y'all thought of that? If, if I really love you because you belong to Christ, I don't care what your church sign says over you because I know who died for you, and I know who died for me, and I know who rose for us. Um, so... The only thing that matters that's different, it doesn't matter if you worship differently, it doesn't matter if you have some different doctrine, except for the doctrine of Christ, obviously, you know. Like, if you're a Mormon, I love you, but we don't share the same faith. If you're Jehovah's Witness, I love you, we don't share the same faith. But I'm talking about denominations within Christianity, such as Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Anglican, Church of God, Assemblies of God, Church of God in Christ and every other denomination that's ever been made up, Orthodox, you know, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, whatever you are, Catholic, all of that. So, and why did I name all those? I'm naming them to say, look, it's a little naive for us to think, well, every church should just become one. I'm like, no, they're not going to because we're already one in Christ, whether they say it or not. Plus, the more denominations that are differently preaching they're preaching the same gospel, but differently worshiping or attracting different people spreads the word of God further all over the globe. So denominations are not, I want to give to you, denominations are not a bad thing. They are a means to spread Jesus everywhere. The pro- again, the problem is when you have people who do not love their brother or sister in Christ, and then denomination is a big deal. And um, they don't really have the full love of Christ in them yet. Um, because I can worship next to any Christian. I don't care if they don't want any music in their church, like just acapella, or if they want to jam out like with a million person mass choir. I don't care how they worship. If they love Jesus, they're my brother or sister, if they follow him. Now, this is another thing. I'm urging us, don't be a one-way Christian. This is what I mean. Um, one way to God, yes, Jesus. But if some Christians are like, I only love Christians that do this, that, and the other. No, be a two-way Christian. What I mean is, I'm going to love my Church of Christ, brothers and sisters, whether or not they love me. And let me tell you, they probably wouldn't love me very much because I'm a woman preaching. But I love them, and I don't care if they love me back because we all belong to Jesus, right? So I'm, and, and I'm not picking on that certain denomination. I'm just giving an example of a huge doctrinal difference in how we we interpret Corinthians and Timothy differently. So why am I saying all this? I'm saying this because I expect us at Evergreen to look at other churches with genuine love, genuine love for those believers, and, and really to, to say, that's my family. That is my brother or sister. Jesus died for us. Like I said, he rose for us. He's coming back for us. And um, Anyways, that's the mac- ma- macro version of Romans 14 is loving everyone around you and knowing you're in a huge family of God if they name the name of Christ. Um, and I'm going to read this verse to you out of John 13, verses 34 through 35. It says, so now, this is Jesus, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So when the world out there sees the church loving each other and caring for each other, then they know Jesus is real. They know he was sent. You can have unity in Jesus without uniformity. Just because I have unity with someone doesn't mean we have to look alike. You know, I don't, conformity doesn't mean unity. That's not what that means. 
Um, conformity is you just got under a scaredy cat system and put yourself under it. Unity is we both believe in Jesus and we're going to be unified in him and we're going to do things on mission for him. And that's one of the things we're most excited about at Evergreen is getting to eventually work with other churches. That's like a dream and something that's going to happen, right? It's going to happen in Jesus name. Um, But so I hope that that really helps us understand, like, how do I see different convictions in the body and yet be able to level it out and be okay with it, right? Um, Because there's some things in my life I don't, I can never go back to. It doesn't matter that other Christians do it. I can't do it. And I already gave you all that example last week and it was yoga because of the kinds of studios I was involved with were very strong in Hinduism. Um, and yoga, the word yoga means yoked and yoked means you're attached to someone or something in an, under their power. Um, the only yoke I want is a yoke of Christ. Okay. So other Christians do it and they don't feel bad about it, but that doesn't matter. I'm not gonna go back to do something just cause I see somebody else doing it and they're okay with it. So just think about that. There are some things you, you and I can do and can't do depending on how, what the Holy Spirit tells us about our spiritual lives, right? So anyways, um, yeah, so I want us to pray this morning and really um, ask the Lord for harmony and for him to um, help us know what what are we supposed to do? What what, um, freedom do we have in him? What freedom do we not have? And let him really touch our hearts and and free us from things. Um, And we can do that on our own, but... um, I also wanted to invite just, you know, maybe all of us up to just pray and seek the Lord up here and just stand up here and pray together. And if you're not able to, you can sit too. But um, yeah, I just wanted us to have a prayer time and we'll have some music on, but just some time that you can seek the Lord and ask him, like, is there anything that, that needs to be harmonized in my life? Is there anything that needs to be left or taken away? And so I hope this has been a helpful message. I'm going to pray over us. um, But then after I pray, I just want us to come up and have that song time to pray on our own as well. So, Father, thank you that you cover everything in your word. There's nothing left out. Genesis to Revelation. Jesus, you're evident as one thread going through the whole story of the Bible. And we thank you that you are our Savior and our Lord. We thank you that you stand at the right, you sit at the right hand of the Father interceding for all of our needs and that you will return. Um, And Lord, we say even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray that. And Lord, um, I just pray as we come forward and as we um, just take time to maybe worship to this song, to pray that, Lord, you would search our hearts. Show us what do I need to lay down? What do I need to pick up? What um, activities am I not doing from faith that could be sin? So Lord, I thank you that you're able to show us all that we need And you're so awesome. And so, Lord, even for those joining in remotely, let them have this time as well with a song to just pray. Pray that you would bless them and touch them, Lord. Show them whatever they need as well as you show us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Yeah, so if you just want to join me, whoever wants to, join me up here to just pray and seek the Lord. Um, And then whatever song you want, Lauren. Especially if you can just put it on something that you can pray to. This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles. Where we proclaim your name. This is a Thank you.
Come and declare your name over us, God. The God of love, the God of mercy. Your, your precious blood has paid for us all. You, you took. All right, I'm on Daniel's height here, so I'll make this work. Um, well, I'm just gonna, 
do a quick sign off. So we are formally dismissed, and you are informally welcome to hang out and uh, just get you know fellowship a bit. Uh, we love you guys online. Bless you. Let us know if there's anything you ever need. We can uh, set up. A, you can chat, or we can even just do a Zoom and, and talk and, and work through that. Um, and uh, God bless you all. I'm gonna I'll say a quick prayer to um, dismiss us. Lord, we thank you for everything you've done today, and we're believing that if you've truly done it, that it's gonna stick. And if there's something we did, I frankly ask you would just wash it off. Let it just in one ear and not the other. But what you said, like Danielle was saying, that the word of God getting down into those down into the, the bones and, and joints and marrow. Let it get in there and just rest down in those spaces. Help, help us in the name of Jesus, we pray. And I uh, ask your special blessing on each person online here and who will watch it later. God bless you, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.